Now that is not a happy note on which to end. Obviously, all great civilizations reach a certain point when they're either invaded from outside, they're struck by some tremendous cataclysm, or they become arrogant like the Aztec in later days, or the Europeans as they are becoming now, or have been for quite a while, but they're becoming more and more arrogant to a point where they may bring about, they may generate within their system a revolt that makes it impossible for them to operate with the kind of certitude with which they operate now. Most of you are filled with a sense of hopelessness when you think of the European giant, the tremendous shadow that he's thrown over the world. But let me tell you that changes have already begun to occur in the 20th century. When I was a boy, one of the things that was told to me repeatedly in which I believed is that the sun would never set on the British Empire. There was absolutely no way when I was growing up that anyone could be mad enough to imagine that Africa or the Caribbean would become independent. Now I'm not saying they're independent, it's a paper independence, but it is a step in that direction. There is a measure of independence and movement away from the metropolitan power. It seemed utterly impossible for such a thing to occur in the world. The imperialist powers of France and England and Germany were so powerful that we did not for a moment believe that anything could happen. But there lay at the heart of the system certain contradictions that eventually exploded so that the European himself without the help of the African, began to destroy himself. After the war in Europe, it was impossible for European powers to maintain their hold in Africa and the Caribbean. Riots broke out everywhere. And the more riots that broke out in Africa, the more riots broke out elsewhere. I remember the only time I heard of anything about Africans that made me feel proud and that made me feel that I could identify with them was during the Mau Mau Rebellion when the radio which we listened to as if it were the Bible, the BBC said that the British Army was closing in on an African who was the right hand man to Kenyatta. Uh, I can't remember his name now, but he, Didan Kamati, Didan Kamati, Didan Kamati ran 40 miles on his toes to escape the pincer movement of the whole British army in Kenya and jumped away from them. It was, that was the first time in my life that I heard of an African different from what I had heard of in Tarzan. That is the first time I began to think that perhaps we were dealing with something else other than what I had been told. It was just a flicker. It was to come later, for example, when books started suddenly to arrive from Russia in English about the revolutions in Africa. And they tried to seize these books, but they couldn't find them. They, we passed them on fast. So the, the tide in the movement began and could not be stopped because suddenly, with almost a religious fervor, note, religious fervor, peoples all over the world began to become conscious of themselves as having the power to change things. That was all. They did not have guns, they did not have bombs. Everything was against them, but they had a new moral force. A new moral force that came out of a contact, not as profound as ours today, but a contact, however flickering, however faint, of another kind of history, of another kind of person. Suddenly, as if what had been buried for centuries in history began to resurrect itself, creating a new sense of person. I was talking today with someone, and this is something that has been raised constantly by students as one travels around the country. Why is it important to talk about what blacks did in America 3,000 years ago or in Africa 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 years ago. What does it matter? The black man is reduced throughout the world. So to talk about what he did or didn't do in ancient times is irrelevant. That is not true. That is not 
true because of the fact that this consciousness is where change begins. Consciousness is the beginning of a new man, beginning of force. It is like putting a plug into, inch, into ancient source of electricity. Something actually happens. One begins invaded with a new energy. I always remember that. There are circuits of energy in the human. Energy has nothing to do with how much food you eat or what is your native constitution. Gandhi had more energy than anybody who was weightlifting. Gandhi could walk into England with his loincloth and sit in the snow without feeling cold. That is energy. It's a different kind of energy. Energy, Gandhi acquired a peculiar kind of energy because he was plugging into something that was different from what the engine had plugged into for a long time under the British. A different conception of freedom and power and dignity. When Gandhi sat at that table and the British said, of course, you don't expect we are going to leave this place, do you? And Gandhi said, yes, you're going to leave this place with an absolute confidence because he knew from the shift in consciousness that there was no way that the British could move against the tide that was riding in the, rising in the consciousness of the Indian people. They were going back to a sense of what they were. They were no longer thinking of themselves as mere extensions of that civilization. That is why we go back into history, because history, its resurrection, its reconstruction, produces different qualities in the human. It is almost like a religious energy and fervor and zeal that rises in consciousness and reshapes the people. That is why one goes back. Because it really affects the living present. Our conception of the world, our consciousness of what is happening is determined by our conception of history. If you think your history starts with slavery, as most black Americans do still, and most whites still do, and Alex Haley's roots didn't change it, merely consolidated it. If you think that history begins with slavery or with primitives in the jungle, there is absolutely no way that you can speak with confidence that you can overturn a civilization because at the root, regardless of any protest that may spring superficially from your mouth, at the very center of your being, there's an absolute conviction that you're dealing with people who are, are essentially superior in every way. They only cease to be essentially superior when you rediscover through your history that it is not so. That Fundamentally, there are large extent invaders who struck as barbarian forces. Other peoples captured them and destroyed not only their cities and their civilizations, but sought systematically, as they still do, to destroy their conception of themselves as people. It is only then through that history, whether it be in Mexico or in Egypt, the recovery of this when one sees that one is at the very center of formative civilization, Olmec was formative. It wasn't just something land, it wasn't just something flowering at La Venta, Tres de Potes, uh, San Lorenzo in Veracruz. It was to touch Mitla, it was to touch Monte Alban, it was to touch Tihotihuacan, it was to touch Platilco, all the great centers. It was even to go right down into South America so that it touched Chavin, Kupisnik, civilization in South America, and we were involved in it. And Egypt was not just Cairo and the Sudan. Egypt touched Europe. The Greek would not have been possible without Egypt. Asia and its great quantum leaps would not have been possible without Egypt. That Nile Valley carried a fire into Europe, a fire into Asia, right through the world. We were there at the heart of that. 